very good day and hope everyone is safe and healthy and welcome to our podcast. Hi, my name is Pavindraj R. Nagaraja, B04191817 and here we have... Hi, I'm Audrey Angjali, name B04198015. Hi, I'm Fakir Rahman, B04191023. Hello guys. Hello. Hi. <laughs> okay guys. Uh, okay, since we have learned about several problems or diseases that mainly affect the cows and it is very interesting, you know, can we discuss about it? Yes, let's go. Yeah. Okay. Okay, as for the introduction, nowadays the rate of cow death and diseases are at the peak. So there are many types of diseases such as paresis procaradis, ketosis, grass tetany, mastesis and many more. This can affect the effectiveness of cows' economical performance in the farm industry too. Oh yeah, I've heard about the paresis procaradis, um, but what, what is that yeah? Ah, yes, Audrey. So this disease is quite known and it is also known as milk fever in cattle. So a disorder that characterized characterized by abnormally low levels of calcium in the blood, also known as hypoglycemia, usually occurs within three days after penetration at the time when the cow's production of milk put a severe strain on its calcium level. I remember reading one article saying that Meat fever paresis properis is a non herbal disease of adult dairy cows caused by an acute calcium deficiency. Other ruminants has lesser effect than cattle. But I'm not sure about the signs shown. Mm, I knew about this. So for their cl- clinical signs, right, they have actually three stages where it worsens from stage 1 to stage 3. So in stage 1, the cow is able to stand and then the hypersensitivity, mild ataxic, uh, ear twitch, head bobbing, and restless are seen. And then in stage 2, horizontal recumbency, subnormal temperature, an erratic dry muzzle, weak peripheral pulse, loss of anal sphincter tone, and then uh, can't urinate, head tucking, and S-shaped curved neck are also observed. Then in stage 3, which is where the cow is already unresponsive, where the heart rate reaches 120 beats per minute and its survival time is uh, already reduced. Um, so did you read any case reports about this milk fever before? Oh, yes, me. So based on the case report, uh, based on the journal of Peritrine Paresis and Hypoglycemia in Ruminal Livestock, so they say that 5 to 10% of all adult dairy cows in US are affected every year. So appro- approximately 75% of all cases of hypoglycemia occur within 24 hours of calving. An additional of 12% occurred to 20, 24 to 48 hours of postpartum. And as cattle age, their ability to mobilize calcium or bone gradually diminishes. At the same time, milk production increases, peaking at about the fourth lactation. Dairy cows with an history of Patriation uh, paresis in the previous lactation are uh, at a very high risk of development in the next uh, lactation. And patriation paresis is a very rare in uh, first calf dairy high first. Lah. So, how do they treat these infected cows? I knew that the treatment for paresis properis is done by restoring normal serum calcium to avoid muscle and nerve damage, intravenous of calcium gluconate, salt. Rule for dosing is around 1 gram calcium per 55 kilogram, uh, 100 pounds per body weight. Single dose 500 ml bottles that contain 8 to 11 gram of calcium. Another is magnesium supplementation. And lastly is administration of oral calciums uh, that avoid the risk of cardiotoxic adverse effects and may be useful in mild cases of par- parturis parus. Oh yeah, uh, we can also control and prevent the paresis properties from happening by delayed or incomplete milking after cowing, which uh, maintains the pressure within the udder and decreases the milk production. Then the use of the dietary cation and anion difference, DCAD, a method that decreases the blood pH of cows during the late prepartum and the early postpartum period. And then uh, we can do by also reducing the potassium content of the diet and it is essential to include corn silage as a major portion of the dry cow's diet. Then by giving vitamin D3 and its metabolite is also a very effective way in preventing the parturian paresis. 
And then alfalfa is also uh, another forage source that may prove uh, beneficial in maintaining the proper blood pH. So we can conclude that milk fever can cause death and this disease has to be prevented to prevent the loss of milk production and well the loss of dairy supplies. So awareness is very much important and with a good management and good diet, this can be prevented. So I'm actually curious though, why do milk fever rarely develop in first lactation? Because um, first lactation dairy cattle, right, they almost never develop the fever because they produce the less cholesterol and they can rapidly mobilize calcium from bone due to the high osteoclastic activity in their growing skeleton. Oh, wow, okay. So besides paresis purpuralis, I think cattle is also prone to ketosis, right? Yep. Another type of disease that can be found in cattle is ketosis. So this condition can be defined as an elevated concentration of ketone bodies such as acetone, acetate, beta hydroxybutyrate, and in all body fluids. It is a common disease of adult cases in uh, adult cattle and typically occurs in dairy cows in the early lactation period. It can be often related to the cow's inability to overcome negative energy balance. I remember there are actually two types of ketosis, which is the subclinical and clinical ketosis, but what is the difference between both of them? Uh? Oh, okay, so as for the subclinical ketosis uh, or CSK can be defined as an elevation of ketone bodies without clinical symptoms or ketosis. So this SCK is associated with the occurrence of uh, many other trans, uh, transition cow diseases such as clinical ketosis, metritis, retain, uh, placenta and left displaced abomasum. So while clinical ketosis is a diagnosis of primary ketosis, it's based on a clinical science clinical pathology and ruling out disorder that can be uh, caused by secondary ketosis, yeah. So do you guys know the pathology of this condition? Yeah, the exact pathogenesis is incompletely understood, but I read before in a journal saying that it actually requires the combination of intense adipose mobilization and high glucose demand. So in the early lactation period, um, the negative balanced energy leads to adipose mobilization and milk synthesis creates a high glucose demand. So it can be divided into two types. The first is the type 1 ketosis, where it commonly occurs during peak milk production, usually around four to six weeks after the parturition. It can be associated with underfed cattle experiencing a metabolic shortage of gluconeogenic precursors. So in the, the second type is the type 2 ketosis where it occurs immediately after the postpartum period around the week 1 to 2. But did you guys know that based on a journal published in 2018 about the subclinical ketosis in a few countries across the continent, the subclinical ketosis prevalence has an average mean of 24%, ranging from 8.3 up to 40.1%. 40, so blood BHB concentration between days 2 and 21 were ranging from an average value of 0.7 millimol per litre in countries such as Australia, Brazil, Colombia, and Russia to up 1.5 millimol per litre in Ukraine. Oh, okay. Tato, but what does it mean by BHB? Okay, so BHB or beta hydroxybutyrate is one way of diagnosing ketosis. Patients with BHB concentration between 1.0 to 1.4 millimol uh, were considered to have subclinical ketosis, while patients with BHB, BHB concentration more than 1.0 millimol per liter were considered to have clinical ketosis. About the clinical signs for ketosis, right? I heard there are three stages. Is it correct? Yep, that's true, Audrey. Yes, clinical signs can be divided into three stages, which is the acute, subacute, and chronic. So the first warning sign of acute ketosis are increased nervousness of cows, profuse salivation, trembling, and spasm of individual muscle groups. The animal begins to ganache its teeth. Extremely sluggish behavior comes to replace nervous excitement. Body temperature is lower, milk gets to smell and of acetone, and milk foams weakly and has a bitter taste. So in subacute stage, the main symptom is impaired appetite and a tendency to eat spoiled food. So diseased cow reject uh, fresh hay and healthy concentrates, 
but they they tend to eat rotten sludge. So there is a clear smell of acetone in milk and urine, and milk kill is significantly reduced. So in the chronic stage, incoordination and gait abnormalities occasionally occur, as to aggression belonging to due to the damage to the nervous system, lah. So is there any treatment for this condition? Uh, yeah, there are actually a few methods that we can apply. First is by oral administration, drums of the propylene glycol, 250 to 400 gram per oral every 24 hours for three to five days, which is the um, standard treatment. Then bolus glucose treatment, where 500 ml of 50% dextrose solution given intravenously as a single bolus, which are suitable in the neurologic cases. Lastly, uh, administration of the vitamin B12 by giving 1.25 mg intramuscularly every 24 hours for 3 days in hypoglycemic cases is the treatment for ketosis. Oh, so how about the steps in preventing the, this condition? What some nutritional factors can play a role in controlling the negative impact of ketosis in dairy cows? Management is the key. In fact, some cows can have high level of ketones and still perform if it managed properly. So, procedure that farmers can do are prevent overcrowding in the transition cow facilities, don't co mingle cows and heifers, reduce the number of pen movements, and monitor body condition score in late lactation cows. So, we can conclude that ketosis is a common and costly disease in dairy cattle as both its clinical and subclinical forms increase risk of other disease and impact production and reproductions. It's important for farmers to know more about this disease to prevent any unwanted condition for, from occurring. Oh, that's interesting. And oh, do you, do you all know that grass tetany is also a very common disease in cattle? So what's a grass tetany? Eh? Grass tetany is also called as the grass staggers. It is actually a highly fatal metabolic disease associated with the low levels of magnesium in the blood in cattle. So it affects all classes of cattle, however, like older cows with calves that they graze the cool season grasses during winter and spring, or emaciated and obese cattle, they are actually more prone to suffer from grass tetany. Oh, since cattle are sus susceptible, is beef cattle more susceptible than dairy calf cattle? Hmm, I don't think so. I think dairy cattle are more susceptible than beef cattle because magnesium needs are greater in lactating animals than non-lactating animals as it is needed in meat production. Oh, I see. I understand. I understand. Uh, what about the prevalence of grass tetany? Um, has anyone like read about this before? Ah, yes, Audrey. Yes, I remember reading this a few months back. It seems that grass tetany is a prevalent in cows that are in a, la a late gestation or heavy lactation in grace, in large spring growing usually in April and May. Lah. So high levels of nitrogen and potassium in the soil increase the risk because they reduce the availability of magnesium to the animal. But how do cattle be at risk uh, of grass tetany though? Low magnesium levels in feed or a reduction in the magnesium absorption will result in a low magnesium level in the blood. That this is the reason why they will be prone to grass tetany. With low magnesium intake by grazing ruminants, they occur especially with some grass species early in the growing season. This is due to the seasonally low magnesium concentration in their forage. Then for lactating cows, a constant source of magnesium is needed to replace the large amount of magnesium loss from the body due to their high levels of milk production. Yeah. Oh, means that those cattle with hypomagnesemia are more prone, right? Then what increases the risk of cattle to be hypomagnesemia? Okay, so cattle fat with grasses grown on leach acid sandy sauce and cereals make them more prone to, to hypomagnesemia uh, as the magnesium level in the feed is low. Feeding cattle with high moisture content grass will also cause a low uptake and reduce the absorption of magnesium resulting from high rumen potassium and nitrogen and low rumen sodium. Yeah, um, are there any like specific clinical signs that can be observed? Oh yes, uh, clinical, uh, I mean as for cattle suffering from grass tetany are often found that 
So they where they lie on their side with stiff outstretched leg and trash backwards and forwards. So early signs that can be observed are aggressive, excitability with muscle twitching, accelerate awareness, a frequent u- urination and stiff gait. Yeah. So, but actually there are many diseases that have similar clinical signs too. Do you all know whether they are in the, are there any differential diagnosis that needs to be paid attention in diagnosing prostatitis? Yeah, I read about this before. Um, prostatitis they can be confused with diseases such as staggers that are caused by toxication of the paralis and perineal rye grasses, or nitrate or nitrate poisoning, lead poisoning, or exotic diseases such as bovine spongiform encephalopathy and the um, Ojewski disease. Um, then what about the treatments for grassetani? Normally, treating grassetani in cattle aims to restore the blood magnesium levels. The gold standard is to administer calcium and magnesium solutions parentally. Calcium is injected intravenously first and followed by subcutaneous injection of magnesium. Mm-hmm. So do you know how shepherds control grassetani from occurring? So management can be done by eliminating factors that reduce magnesium absorption and providing cattle with magnesium supplements. Salt mixture containing magnesium oxide can be added as a magnesium source. Lactating cows or old age cattle should be given high legumes and high dry matter pasture. Then, grazing activity on a new grass is avoided until it is 4 to 6 inches tall because magnesium is less available in immature plants. Then what about the challenges in controlling grass tetany in cows? Oh, yes, good question, Audrey. So as for the grass tetany, it's considered a serious emergency disease process as death can occur within hours of the clinical sign presentation. In many cases, animals may found dead in the morning, becoming clinical during the overnight. So the animal will expire within a couple of hours without treatment. So you have to be very careful. Uh, Okay, so it means that um, grass tetany is actually a serious yet preventable disease caused by severely low levels of magnesium in the blood. And it can strike cattle at an alarmingly fast rate which makes the detection and the treatment to be difficult. But actually with a good management program and regular forage testing during grazing, um, this grass tetany can actually easily be prevented in cattle. Yeah. Mm, wow. Okay. Okay. Wow, that was a very good discussion though. We actually learned a lot from these three particular topics. So, okay, that's all. Oh my God, I'm so like excited and I learned a lot. So, so that's all from us. Thank you for lending your ears throughout this podcast and we hope that you learn something new from this podcast and from us today. So thank you again. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay happy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.